Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening and welcome to CG's Ottawa Lecture Series, or the Centre for International Governance Innovation. Our aim in convening these public talks has always been to allow leading experts and influencers the opportunity to bring their insights and expertise directly to key stakeholders and contributors in policymaking in Canada and indeed around the world. Thank you very much again for joining us this evening. Climate change is rapidly becoming one of the most critical issues on the international agenda. There is no region that is immune to the effects of climate change, and the consequences permeate nearly every aspect of society, from international trade and the economy to healthcare to human rights. The eye-opening special report of the, of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published last year presented a stark reality that much more significant efforts are required by all nations in order to combat the effects of climate change. However, some states are shying away from the problem and leaving it to other countries to address, or worse, are remaining willfully blind and refusing to acknowledge the circumstances altogether. Canada, on the other hand, has been active in promoting action, action on climate change, both domestically and at the international level. There is no doubt in my mind, that Canada's fight against climate change has been aided through the tireless work of many of the individuals in this very room tonight that are here this evening, including our keynote speaker, Ambassador Patricia Fuller. However, before I introduce Ambassador Fuller, first I would like to ask my colleague, Una Fitzgerald, the Director of the International Law Research Program at CG, to provide a brief overview of some of the groundbreaking research that's taking place on this very issue at CG. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Una Fitzgerald. Good evening. It's wonderful to see you all here, and um, those of you who heed the concern, the urgency about climate change. So it's, it's great to see that this is still an important issue to everybody. Um, the law program at the Center for International Governance Innovation has done quite a lot of work on climate change issues. It's been one of the leading um, topics that we, we started with, and uh, we're carrying it forward today and, and into the future because there's so many issues that still need to be addressed. Um, the law program looks at different issues around international law and governance. governance. So we look at um, economic law issues and um, issues around intellectual property law and innovation. We also look at issues around um, indigenous people's rights and, and um, international law affecting indigenous people. Um, and then in the environmental area, we, have, we look at the question of law and governance in the climate change regime. So some of the issues include loss and damage, clean technology, the Article 6 uh, mechanism for um, internationally, um, what is it, transferred? <laughs> ITMOs. ITMOs for short, yes. Um, non-market mechanisms as well. We also look at uh, the question of the interface between international climate law and other fields. So you often hear the, the point that um, how, can you, how can you do these, these uh, progressive measures in relation to climate change if it's gonna impact on your trade obligations? So we're doing a big project on that and, and that's extremely important. And we're also looking at investment law and, um, and then also finance law, and it's great to see so many people here who have knowledge about green finance, because that's, that's certainly an important area. So we're interested in the whole spectrum of climate change issues from the development of rules, the rules, um, the rules book, and, um, and then the implementation and the transition to a, a green uh, eco economy. Now related, work also touches on oceans. We have a big study on law and governance of the oceans. Uh, we're looking at deep seabed mining, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, and even geoengineering uh, using um, in the ocean sector. And uh, one of the studies we did that really crosses over between climate change and oceans was a big study on the shipping, uh, the maritime shipping industry and how they need to adapt to, um, to change practices to uh, lower their carbon footprint. Um, and last of all, in the environmental law group, uh, research focuses on Arctic law and governance. And as you know, the Arctic is changing because of climate change. And so all those sorts of new issues arise as a result. Now, um, Sylvia Masiunas, who's sitting in the front row, one of my colleagues, um, will 
probably make links between all this work and the, the presentation we're going to hear from Ambassador Fuller tonight. Um, I would also mention that there's a lot of cross-cutting issues that, that we work on in the international law program, and these also have impacts on climate change. So one of the uh, areas we're looking at is the international, transnational, and domestic law related to technology, big data, artificial intelligence, and clean technology. Another is a study of the role of the corporation in uh, international, transnational, and domestic law. And obviously, the corporation plays an enormous role in fighting climate change. They can be both an actor in support of climate action, and they can also be an impediment. So that's an important study. We're also looking at the um, more, uh, more local recent event, the um, negotiation of the Canada-US-Mexico Free Trade Agreement, as we call CUSMA in Canada. Um, and we're analyzing that from various points of view, but one of them obviously will be the question of environmental protection and, and climate change. And finally, uh, one of our cross-cutting topics is gender equality and the need for innovative approaches to international law and governance in the context of sustainable development. And I've already had conversations with people in this room about how um, climate change impacts on, on women and how it's really important to, um, to engage them in addressing these issues. So um, that's just to give you a sense of the type of work we do in the International Law Research Program. Please do come and speak to me or to my, my colleague Sylvia um, or to Aaron about this work. Uh, we'd love to hear your views and get you involved. And um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron again. Thank you. Um, you know, it's we're absolutely privileged as a, as a think tank or a public policy research institution to have a, a strong international law team. And um, I know that some think tanks may have one or, or two international lawyers. We literally have a team of some of the best in the world, so we're very privileged. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Ambassador, Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change, Patricia Fuller. Ambassador Fuller holds an Honours Bachelor of Arts in Economics and Political Studies from Queen's University and a Master of Science with Distinction and I'll pause there, for, with distinction, from the London School of Economics. Her career has traversed, well, you know what, I'll, I'll pause, I'm gonna come off script for one moment. To say that she's had a distinguished uh, career would be an understatement, um, but uh, her career has traversed areas of trade and economic policy, as well as climate change and energy. She has held offices at Natural Resources Canada, Global Affairs Canada. She has served as uh, Ambassador of Canada to Uruguay and Chile, uh, and has fulfilled additional international assignments in Mexico and Guatemala. On June 5th, 2008, Ambassador Fuller was appointed Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change. In this role, she advises the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, as well as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, on how Canada can best advance climate change policies at the international level. She works closely with Canadian missions to implement the Government of Canada's clean growth and climate change priorities, and to promote Canada's clean technology sector to global investors. We are honored to have Ambassador Fuller here to discuss Canada's role in advancing global action on climate change. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to this evening's keynote speaker, Patricia Fuller, Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change. Bonsoir, good evening. What a great pleasure to be here in this uh, audience of the Center for International Governance, uh, uh, which is a center that I have, uh, I feel like I have a long relationship with. Uh, I remember uh, its creation. Uh, I can date myself by saying that I do remember when, when CG was, was created and, and as a student of international political economy at the time, it, it was very exciting to see a center created in Canada to study international governance, governance, an area that Canada has so much to contribute to the world. And then, uh, more recently, we were, very recently, we were able to, to partner, uh, Sylvia uh, uh, and others, on an event that took place in Brussels around uh, the relationship between trade and, and climate change. Uh, and this in the context of the work we're doing to try to secure the ratification of the trade agreement with the European Union. So that's uh, just by way of saying that these linkages matter. So we're very happy that, uh, that CG is doing, is doing work on this. Uh, 
So, um, so as Aaron has, has noted, I was named to this position in, in June, and I'm the sixth uh, ambassador for climate change. Uh, some people think that this is a, a new office, but it has existed for some time. But under this government, the role was uh, modified to include the promotion of, of clean technology, as, as Aaron has mentioned. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. So tonight, I'd like to speak to you about what Canada is doing to advance climate action globally and the opportunities that the global transition to a low carbon economy presents for Canada. But let me start with the science. I do so with some trepidation, knowing there, there are scientists in the, in the audience. But uh, uh, let's just uh, uh, review the facts. Um, so today, uh, the global mean temperature, the global average temperature, is approximately one degree above pre-industrial levels. And in Canada, the rate of warming is approximately twice the, the rate of global warming. So one degree of warming doesn't sound like a lot, but we can see the evidence already of what just one degree of warming means. So people are already experiencing more severe heat waves, as well as the implications of those heat waves for drought and wildfires. The warmer atmosphere is holding more moisture, which means more precipitation, and that has implications for flooding. Rapidly declining <clears throat> sea ice and snow cover, thawing permafrost and rising sea levels are also already apparent. And the economic and social costs are also becoming more evident. In Canada, the cost of property damage associated with weather has gone from just over 400 million a year in the, the roughly two decades before 2008 to 1.8 billion a year in more, in more recent years. And the health costs associated with extreme weather are estimated at, at over 1.6 billion per year. So, we know that without concerted global action to reduce emissions, these and other impacts will accelerate. And speaking of governance, concerted global action is what the Paris Agreement is all about. So the Paris Agreement contains uh, the, the commitment to limit global warming to below two degrees and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees. And as Aaron mentioned, the recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded that the consequences of exceeding 1.5 degrees would be severe for ecosystems, for biodiversity, for human health. And the report also stated that if we are to keep global temperatures within this boundary of 1.5 degrees, we must cut emissions in half by 2030 and almost to zero by 2050. As it stands, the commitments under the Paris Agreement, if implemented, would uh, result in warming in the range of three degrees, so roughly double what the recent IPCC report says we need to aim for. <clears throat> this shouldn't, however, be pointed to as a failure or a flaw in the Paris Agreement. The need for countries to increase their ambition over time was well recognized and anticipated at the time of its negotiation in 2015. And so built into the agreement is what's called the ambition cycle, or the requirement for countries to review their targets every five years with a view to increasing them. And while it may seem surprising that uh, targets set for the future would change over time, this approach does make sense. And that's because the as, as this global transition to a low carbon economy gets underway, new technologies will become commercialized, the price of uh, existing technologies will continue to fall, and when that happens, it will be easier to increase ambition. But there's also much we can and must do now to drive that ambition cycle forward, and that's what I would like to, to focus on this evening in terms of how Canada is working with global partners to accelerate climate action. So we're doing so in three ways. One, through climate diplomacy. Secondly, through our assistance to developing countries. And thirdly, through our own policy leadership in taking action to reduce emissions in Canada. 
So starting with climate diplomacy, we've advanced a series of priorities, and I'll give three examples. Two key ones are the effective implementation of the Paris Agreement, as well as the phasing out of coal-fired electricity. And a third related area is the work we're doing on ocean's health and reduction of plastic waste. So starting with the implementation of the Paris Agreement, a key step along the road to implementation of this agreement was the successful conclusion of what is known, as Aaron or Una uh, referenced it, the, the Paris Rulebook last December in Poland. And this was not easy. Many of the challenging issues that were the subject of, of delicate compromise in the Paris Agreement resurfaced during the negotiations of the rulebook. But a sig significant factor in the success was the grouping of key economies that Canada co-chaired together with the EU and China. Uh, Canada also worked with the High Ambition Coalition, which reflects the views of small island states for which climate change is really an existential issue. So how does the rule book that was achieved in Poland support enhanced ambition? It does so by ensuring transparency in reporting. And this is something that Canada placed a lot of emphasis on in the negotiations. This is the old uh, saying of what gets measured gets done. And the rule book, as it has been now negotiated, asks countries to provide clear measurements of their emission reductions, as well as transparent information on their targets. So this will enable civil society, business, researchers, people like CG, uh, to effectively monitor what is being accomplished globally. And this is crucial to creating the conditions for stepping up ambition. So then turning to uh, the challenge of coal-fired electricity, this accounts for 40% of global emissions. And it's clear that we cannot meet the goals of the Paris Agreement without phasing out unabated coal power. To create momentum for the phase out of coal-fired ele electricity, we established, together with the United Kingdom, the Powering Past Coal Alliance. Countries in this alliance have committed to phasing out traditional coal power, and the alliance has gone from an initial membership of some 20 countries to, <clears throat> as of uh, the, the meeting in Poland, 80 members. And the work of this alliance is particularly important when we consider that new coal plants are still being built in some parts of the world. Energy needs are growing rapidly in developing countries, and there's considerable inertia behind coal as a means of meeting those needs. So the purpose of this alliance is to support dialogue around how these needs can be met with clean energy and to allow policymakers to exchange with each other on strategies for phasing out coal. It is not an easy challenge, but it's already evident that this alliance is supporting useful and practical dialogue among its members, and we look to extend this dialogue to interested non-members. So also related to climate diplomacy is the work that we did in our G7 presidency to advance the Oceans Plastics Charter. This charter commits signatories to action towards a resource efficient life cycle management approach to plastics in the economy. This will not only reduce waste and litter that is released into the environment, and in particular into our oceans, but it will also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> and this kind of focus on resource efficiency is, is central to increasing ambition, as we have to look across all sectors of the economy to find ways to enhance sustainability and reduce energy and resource use. While our climate diplomacy advances, it's equally important to provide support to developing countries to reduce their emissions. This is key for meeting climate goals, as while emissions of developed countries have peaked, the emissions of developing countries are still growing. Developing countries are also more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. We don't need only think about the devastating consequences of droughts in Africa or hurricanes and sea level rise for small island states. So that's why developed countries pledged to mobilize $100 billion annually in climate finance by 2020. The latest international assessments indicate that we are on track to meet that target. 
And Canada, as part of this, is delivering $2.65 billion in climate finance over five years. And this assistance is supporting projects in developing countries around the world. And two features stand out in Canada's approach to climate finance. One has been the effort to leverage private sector investment to magnify the impact of our investments and to create the environment for follow-on private investment. For example, in utility-scale solar projects in Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean. We also made sustainable finance and mobilization of investment in development a key theme of our G7 presidency. Secondly, Canadian climate finance is well known for seeking to advance gender equality in keeping with our feminist international assistance policy. We see this as a means of advancing human rights and achieving more effective results. For instance, Canada is supporting concessional, concessional loans to women farmers and women-owned agricultural businesses in Sri Lanka that are affected by climate change, working through local financial institutions. The third area where Canada is accelerating global action on climate change is through policy leadership at home. What we do at home matters in terms of what we can achieve internationally. So, for example, the international community is paying attention to Canada's approach to putting in place a carbon price across the country. Quebec and British Columbia were pioneers in this area, having had carbon pricing in place for over 10 years. And now, our approach to recognizing different systems already in place while establishing a common national benchmark is also seen as innovative. And one of the fora where we share this expertise is the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, which we co-chair, and which has a membership of almost 200 businesses and governments. Another area of interest is uh, how we are achieving coal phase-out in Canada. And through the Powering Past Coal Alliance that I spoke of earlier, Alberta, for example, is sharing its strategy and its progress to date. And our task force uh, at, the, at the federal level on just transition for coal workers and communities is also an example of interest internationally. And countries are interested in how we put together the pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change, working jointly together with provinces and territories and in con consultation with indigenous groups as well as stakeholders across the country. It is that whole process uh, that took place in, in 2016 is a model that other countries are interested uh, to follow. So while we're working to accelerate climate action internationally, we're also committed to accelerating our leadership on clean technology. And it's clear that in this century, the countries that will be most successful economically will be the countries that lead the transition to a low carbon economy. So if we look at the building blocks of a transition to a low carbon economy, and in particular low carbon energy, <coughs> namely energy efficiency, renewable energy, and electrification, we find that Canadian companies are excelling in all of these areas. Energy efficiency holds the potential to meet as much as 40% globally of the Paris Agreement goal. In other words, just wasting less energy can get us 40% of the way there. Canadian firms are excelling in LED lighting systems, smart building technologies, and design of energy efficiency programs. In renewables, Canadian companies have expertise across the spectrum, from solar to offshore wind, geothermal, biofuels, and we're seeing the that the experience of Canadian companies in working in remote areas is particularly applicable globally. And with respect to electrification, Canada has, of course, been a long-standing leader in electricity transmission. And now Canadian companies are taking on the challenge of integrating renewables into electricity grids. Electric buses are also emerging as a clear area of strength. And then there is carbon capture, use, and storage. And this area is widely seen as key to achieving a rapid reduction in emissions. A range of Canadian companies are doing exciting things in this area, including creating products that use captured carbon dioxide. In other words, creating a value for carbon dioxide. <clears throat> and while energy is central in the transition to a low carbon economy, there are many other solutions that will play a big role and areas where Canada also has strengths. 
So for example, forestry and land use will play a significant role in sequestering and reducing emissions. And one solution is precision agriculture. It offers ways for farmers to use technology to reduce resource use as well as emissions and limit deforestation. And there's greater use of wood in construction as another means of sequestering carbon. These are both areas where Canadian companies are leaders. So to seize the opportunities that global low carbon transition represents, we must also create the conditions for clean tech companies to succeed in our domestic market. <clears throat> and that is where, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Um, carbon pricing, as well as regulations that limit emissions, are critical push factors for clean tech development in our domestic market. And in terms of public investment, the government is providing over $2 billion in support for clean technology across the spectrum from R&D to commercialization and global market development. And these efforts are bearing fruit. The clean tech sector is growing at twice the pace of the rest of the economy. 13 companies are on the global clean tech 100 list, a list that represents the most innovative and promising clean tech technology companies from around the world. And the global clean tech innovation index, which, which highlights countries where clean tech companies are most likely to emerge in the next 10 years, ranked Canada number one for innovation in the G20. So taking all of this together, we can say that Canada is contributing leadership to the challenge of accelerating climate action globally. And at home, we're creating the conditions to scale up our clean tech leaders. So while the challenge of climate change is daunting, the solutions hold incredible opportunities for innovation and growth, as well as for creating healthier environments for our communities. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward uh, uh, to uh, a dialogue with uh, those of you who are present here tonight. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, such an insightful uh, uh, discussion tonight. And I know that probably there's going to be some questions that, that folks have, and the ambassadors uh, graciously agreed to, to, to answer questions from the floor. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, please just raise your hand. Um, we have uh, folks that can bring the microphone to you. And I just ask you simply to introduce yourself and, and ask your question, okay? So we have one at the back here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is it working? Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was an amazing uh, presentation as usual. Uh, Eddie Perez from Climate Action Network. We, uh, we support all the efforts and we work together at COP24, which is always an amazing opportunity to cooperate with the government. Um, I think 2019, in contrast of 2018, which was an international year for Canada because of the G7 presidency, 2018 brings a new challenge, which is um, it's uh, an election year, and Canada, um, you know, has to. Um, we will go through a process internally about what kind of new projects are we, we're going to present to Canadians. But there's a specific moment that is going to take place in September, which is the United Nations Secretary General Summit. And I'm wondering what is the plan, what is Canada's plan in terms of making sure that our experience, our positive experience in climate action is going to be um, translated into uh, something we can share with the other countries. Um, and I think the UNSG will be a moment also to speak about climate urgency. So could you give us maybe a little bit of insight if you have some in terms of the UNSG summit? Thank you. Certainly. Thank you for the, the question. Uh, indeed, the UN Secretary General Summit will be an important milestone this year. And it does fall in the uh, writ period. I'm sure I can use this that word in this uh, room full of lawyers, <laughs> several lawyers here anyway. So uh, uh, that does mean that in the actual summit, uh, there would be uh, certainly a constraint in terms of uh, uh, Canada's uh, profile and participation, but, but I think uh, that in the preparatory process for the summit, 
uh, as we see the tracks of work emerging, um, <clears throat> there is plenty of opportunity for Canada to contribute thought leadership to that pro process. And, and financing is, is one area where Canada, through our ambassador in New York, has done a lot of work in leading uh, that whole kind of uh, transformation of how we, we, we move to more sustainable finance. And um, that's going to be an area of focus within uh, uh, the, the summit that the, the French are, are leading and uh, will also be part of their G7 presidency, picking up a lot on the work that Canada did in, in our presidency. I think uh, nature-based solutions uh, is another area that will be uh, uh, part of the uh, of uh, the work that goes into the summit. And uh, again, building on the work we did in our G7 presidency around oceans, uh, I think we'll be able to contribute uh, uh, to the thinking that will go into the preparations. So. Good question. Thank you. Do we have any <coughs> other questions? Sort of room full of lawyers and no questions. God. Yes. I shouldn't have said that. There's probably a room full of, of very accomplished people from all walks of life, but I can see a few lawyers out there. <laughs> so thank you for a, a very interesting presentation. My name is Tony Lovkovich. I'm from the University of Ottawa. And I teach uh, first year students about the impacts of climate change. I found myself doing so, particularly in terms of the North this week. and. At the end of three hours, I was depressed, and I think the students were generally depressed as well. So I would very much appreciate um, perhaps some comments from you about the next time I teach a class on climate change to say what are positive aspects in terms of moving forward so that mm. the scale of climate change, which is predicted, and the impacts of climate change, which will be not just on Canada but worldwide, what is the positive message I can give them about government action and perhaps their own action uh, to mitigate the impacts of climate change in their lifetimes? Uh, because their lifetimes will go to 2100. They'll be old and gray, as I point out, or older mm -hmm. and grayer than I am. And I think looking at that long term is very meaningful for students that are still 19 or 20 years old. And I basically, I'd really appreciate your, your comments on that to help me the next time I teach it. Thank you. Mm. Well, I, I guess I would just say that, you know, particularly as I know we were chatting earlier and you've spent quite a lot of time in, in the North, uh, uh, when I look for optimism, I always come back to what can Canada offer to this, to meeting this challenge? What, what are the innovations that Canadians can offer to the world in meeting this challenge? And um, as I mentioned briefly in, in, in my remarks, it has been evident that Canadian companies that have experience in working in remote regions, particularly the North, that kind of expertise is very valuable internationally in working in remote areas, for example, and developing a geothermal project, for example. So I guess I would just encourage that as you engage in the North and you see what are the kinds of things that uh, the kinds of skills that we've built up in that environment, how those are applicable to, to the innovations that we have to undertake, I guess not, not only to reduce emissions, but also to adapt to it. Uh, the North is uh, really uh, 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 the, 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 the polar regions are, are uh, the, the most uh, extreme in terms of, of temperature change, as you well know. So. Uh, the whole uh, challenge of adaptation in the north. I think we have things that we can draw from that. Traditional knowledge is, is one area, for example, as we work to integrate the traditional knowledge of indigenous people into what we are seeing and, and analyzing around adaptation, uh, around impacts, and, and then around uh, uh, how to adapt to those impacts. I think you know that kind of process of how do we take that and share that with others globally who, who can also look for traditional knowledge in their countries as a source of, uh, of, of uh, analysis and 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 a, and a source for action. So. Maybe we'll take uh, one or two more questions if there's any on the floor. Why don't we we'll, we'll go to Mike and then we'll come up to the front. <clears throat> Mike Andred, I'm in the solar industry, so you're saying nice things about solar, and I appreciate that. But uh, we, um, I think, um, 
speaking from the solar industry, the, the, the latest studies have shown that solar probably is the cheapest source of energy. Like this is from Lazard and Bloomberg and stuff like that. So kind of the battle's over in terms of the actual facts around solar. Yet it seems to me that um, that's not going to carry the day. And so I am interested in, in uh, I think, the role you're playing probably is going to play a bigger role now that solar's reached that point, is that um, these things are uh, require a lot of cooperation between nations in order to avoid free rider effects and tragedy of commons and stuff like that. Are you seeing that the, the, the global community is really acting, you think, in good faith in trying to solve this problem, or do you feel people are playing the game? And Because uh, I think the facts are there that change could happen, but I think it's really not going to be a technical issue. I think it's going to be a political issue, and I'm mm. interested in your view on that from the front mm. lines. Well, I, I, I agree that much of the challenge is policy rather than uh, uh, technical, because I would agree that many of the solutions are, are, are already there. Although, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, the cost curves are the key, right? The falling prices in well, solar power, wind energy, battery storage, all of that is 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 where uh, the game changers, I think, are really happening. But in terms of free riders, I, I guess um, I, I, what I would say is that I think uh, 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 there is a very wide recognition of the economic opportunity that this transition represents. And so uh, if we look at some of the bigger emitters globally, uh, uh, they are also leading in some ways in terms of policy actions uh, around uh, 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 emission reductions, whether it's in you know, the move to electric vehicles, for, for example, energy efficiency, other areas. We can think about bold moves that uh, uh, some countries are taking who are, who are, who are significant emitters. So. Um, that's not to say that that everyone is on moving rapidly ahead at the pace that they should be moving. I think this is a process, and that's why our work diplomatically and through these kinds of alliances is so important to to keep that momentum going. And also, I think uh, you know just to reiterate that what we do domestically matters. We we cannot be credible voices for climate action internationally unless we're taking bold steps domestically, which we are. So uh, we, we do have, a, we are in a position in which we can do things like co-lead with the United Kingdom, this powering past coal alliance. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a process and it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, but I'm optimistic. So. We have a question up here and then we'll go to the back for the last question. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It was excellent. Uh, Denise and you, okay, we know each other, um, from Colleges and Institutes Canada. And as you talked about what you are hearing or the people that you meet, uh, both domestically and internationally, I'm curious to hear about um, how many times, and I don't mean in, in, in numbers, but does the skills, take a big, um, uh, do people uh, ask you questions about skills, uh, both domestically and internationally, because you talked about international aid, for example, and we often hear about green skills, the importance of green skills, but I'm curious to know from your point of view where you sit with the people you meet uh, what could you tell us about that that could help us to move the yardstick? Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, there's uh, uh, two areas in which skills tend to come up. Uh, one is uh, certainly around that whole area of, of innovation and what are the skills that these new emerging industries will require. Uh, and uh, um, I think you know, we, 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 we shouldn't think about green skills as, as one sort of area of the economy. It's transversal across all sectors, and all uh, sectors that are looking for ways to reduce emissions are going to find that they need skills in, and, and, are, and in Canada, luckily, have uh, many skills in, in, uh, <clears throat> uh, in those areas. 
uh, so many come to mind in terms of uh, you know, engineering and so on, where where uh, um, that that expertise becomes very important. The other area where skills is talked about is in uh, the the area of transition of of uh, communities and workers uh, from industries, and this has come up in the in the context again of the phase out of coal. Uh, you know, it's very important that we think about how uh, workers are transitioned to to uh, areas that are growing, or uh, you know, all sorts of strategies that can be brought to bear on that, and that's the work of this. Uh, uh, task force, which uh, has been underway now for for some time, and will report shortly on how do we support the the transition of communities and workers uh, who are affected by coal phase out. So I think that's that's an area which I'm sure in in your role, you know, thinking about uh, the transition of, of workers who may be you know mid career or older. That that's that's a challenge we need certainly need to to think about. So. Okay. We'll go to the back for the last question, um, and then we'll, uh, I'll turn to my colleague Sylvia Misunas for a brief uh, summation. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your presentation. Arturo Hernández from the Mexican Embassy. Mm. My question is more political, perhaps. Uh, since uh, <clears throat> 1945, August, when the two nuclear explosions took place in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then uh, tens or hundreds of nuclear tests that were carried out by different countries in uh, the planet have surely, uh, you, don't need to be, you don't need to be a scientist to imagine the effect on climate change of those nuclear testings. And now these days we are witnessing the resurgence of the nuclear race between the United States and this, the Russian, uh, the Russian Federation. Has Canada thought on having a more comprehensive policy, even including in combating climate change in adhering to the international treaty to ban the nuclear arms that was approved a few months ago in the United Nations, that will help a lot to have a more coherent and comprehensive view from Canada. I don't know if you have considered these effects because we're living in an uncertain world in which allies have been treated like enemies or even as national security to the United States, as the case of Canada, on trade. And that can happen any moment uh, I think we are living very risky times, and uh, the efforts of the international community to ban nuclear weapons, I think, is important for the survival of humanity, and of course, climate change included. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I, I can't speak to the specific question uh, of our position on, on uh, what you referenced, but uh, what I can say is that the linkage between climate change and security is an important one. And there was a, a conference recently uh, 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 in New York that focused on that. And I think that's getting increasing attention because climate change is a, a, uh, 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 a, a, uh, a magnifier of, of, of security threats uh, as populations become uh, under stress. Uh, so that is... Uh, uh, I think uh, an important area for uh, uh, research and, and thinking in terms of how to, to limit those threats and, and, uh, uh, um, and, and collaborate in the effort to, to do so. so. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll call on my colleague Sylvia Masunas to pro provide a brief summation and a vote of thanks. Um, before doing so, just a, a brief kind of housekeeping matter. So um, uh, we will be hosting a, a reception uh, immediately following the lecture. And so uh, this is nice because it's in many ways it's our ability to continue the conversation because this is not something that gets solved in one evening. And uh, I appreciate um, all that Ambassador Fuller is doing and I appreciate Canadian leadership uh, in this space. But it, they, there's that old saying where it takes a village and it, it literally does. So I look forward to continuing the conversation and I know that the ambassador will join us uh, at the reception, so please uh, uh, feel free to, uh, to stay after the lecture for the reception. Uh, now I'd like to call on Sylvia Messinas, the Deputy Director of Environmental Law at CG. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. Um, and thank you very much, Ambassador Fuller, uh, for giving us some remarks uh, about climate change. Uh, ambassador Fuller took us through 
uh, some of the impacts we're facing now uh, from climate change. I think we all are aware uh, in our everyday lives um, of, of what's happening in terms of the problems with weather, extreme weather, economic impact, and, and so on. So we can't deny that climate change is happening anymore. The Paris Agreement, which uh, Ambassador Fuller spoke to us about, was in fact, I think, an excellent um, collaborative approach of nations uh, to address the issue. Um, it was pointed out that it is an evolving instrument that allows nation states to go further than they have gone to now. The, the combined efforts of the nationally determined contributions of states will only bring us to somewhere around three degrees, um, but it's necessary to go further, uh, but the Paris Agreement does provide some mechanism for, for doing that. But what I think has been most interesting in these uh, remarks today was the fact that Canada is taking a three-pronged approach uh, to the climate uh, problem. Uh, Ambassador Fuller talked about uh, climate diplomacy. I think that's really important in today's world, uh, especially where some of the bigger powers uh, have either ambivalent approaches or might be pulling back uh, from the leadership positions they've had. So I think the work that is being done with the EU and China and uh, also with, uh, with others uh, is very useful in advancing the climate agenda and, and bringing together that momentum you need sometimes when you go to international meetings uh, to get things done. Um, aid to developing countries is also a really important um, factor because, in fact, the, their emissions will be growing and the Paris Agreement accounts for that and allows for that. And so that brings us to clean tech, which is part of the solution uh, for them uh, and also for us because, as pointed out, there's a huge economic opportunity there because what we're really talking about today when we talk about climate diplomacy and we talk about... Um, aid to developing countries and also about domestic leadership is about a profound transformation of societies. And that transformation is going to require uh, political will, but also new ways of doing things, new technologies, also new ways of paying for things. Uh, we need to talk about sustainable finance, which I think was was brought out, and, and that's a, an area of interest as well for CG. So we'll also be looking at how international uh, frameworks can help the transition. So um, with that, thank you very much, Ambassador Fuller, uh, for your remarks, and thank you all for coming. And if you ever want to talk about climate change and get involved in our work, uh, we'd, we'd welcome the conversation tonight and at a later date. Thank you. Thank you.